A virus is one of the stranger things in life. For about a hundred years, the scientific community has repeatedly changed its mind over what viruses are. They were first seen as poisons. In fact, the word virus has its roots in the Latin term for poison. Then they were seen as life forms, then biological chemicals. And viruses today are thought of as being in a gray area between living and non-living. They can't replicate on their own, but can do so once they come in contact with cells of a living organism. Now, in order for something to be considered alive, it has to be able to generate energy and the molecules needed to sustain itself. It also has to be able to reproduce. A virus can't do any of this on its own, which means it's basically dead until it comes in contact with a living thing, hijacks its cells, and reproduces inside the organism that it's infected. If we were to become infected with a virus, we can take medication to make the symptoms feel better, but we can't take medication that would kill the virus itself. Like we would with a bacterial infection, for example, where we take medication that kills off harmful bacteria. Antibiotics do this by targeting bacterial cells and killing them off. But since viruses are not made up of cells, there's nothing for an antibiotic or any medication to really target. Instead of cells, viruses are made up of a core genetic material, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protective coat called a capsid, and then an envelope. So if we can't treat a virus with medication, how do we get rid of them? What is it about viral infections that make us feel so sick? And most importantly for us to understand right now, what is the coronavirus? Why did the World Health Organization declare this new viral outbreak a public health emergency of international concern? And how worried should we be? Today on Cognitive Culture, you'll learn about viruses, specifically the coronavirus. Hit the subscribe button if you like what you see so I can continue to make these happen. A virus is a microscopic organism that can replicate only inside the cells of a host organism. Approximately 5,000 different viruses have been described in detail at this current time, although it's known that there are millions of distinct types. Viruses can infect animals, plants, fungi, and even bacteria. They're found in virtually every ecosystem on Earth, and these minute life forms are thought to be the most abundant type of biological entity. The common concept of viruses focuses on their role as a pathogen but there are a vast number of viral entities that are beneficial to individual species, as well as providing ecosystem services. For example, a class of viruses known as bacteriophages can kill off a spectrum of harmful bacteria, providing protection to humans as well as other animals. Sometimes a virus can cause a disease so dangerous that it's fatal. Other viral infections trigger no noticeable reaction. A virus may also have one effect on one type of organism and a different effect on another. This explains how a virus that affects a cat may not affect a dog. Viruses vary in complexity, so it's a bit challenging to fully understand them individually. So instead of trying to cast such a wide net to understand all viruses, which would be impossible, we mostly focus on the kind that have a harmful effect on humans and animals. There are 219 virus species that are known to be able to infect humans. The first one of these to be discovered was yellow fever virus in 1901, and three to four species are still being found every year. A virus that has come to our attention in the past few weeks is the new coronavirus. Coronaviridae are a family of viruses that cause disease in birds and mammals. These kind of viruses are named for the crown-like spikes on their surface, resembling a crown. The new type of coronavirus that was recently found in central China's Wuhan city is spreading so quickly that it's prompted global alarm. With Beijing's neighbors closing their borders, global airlines suspending flights, and some governments even barring entry to foreign nationals who have recently been in China. The vast majority of the victims have been in China, although the virus has now spread to over two dozen countries. In an attempt to limit the spread of the virus to countries with weaker health systems, the World Health Organization declared the new viral outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. It's thought to have originated in a seafood market in Wuhan, and it's part of a family of viruses that include the common cold and severe acute respiratory syndrome. The coronavirus spreads primarily through droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes, and it can also spread via contaminated surfaces. Because of the way that the coronavirus spreads, one thing that we've seen recently is a lot of people wearing masks to stay safe. A lot of the masks that people are wearing are soft surgical masks, and these are designed to prevent the wearer from spreading their germs, but they don't prevent inhalation of airborne germs. These masks have loose sides that prevent them from being an effective tool for disease prevention. 
If you feel that you're at risk of infection, the mask that you want so you can protect yourself is a respirator mask, which is what a doctor would wear around highly contagious patients. These masks are completely sealed and do actually offer protection. A lot of people don't know this. I mean, it's one thing to not be safe, but it's way worse to think you're being protected when you're not. It took me about a week of long hours of work to create this video. And as I moved forward and edited, the death tolls and number of infections kept rising, making me go back frequently to add new data. So depending on when you watch this video, stats may be different. As of right now, it looks like there are rapidly increasing numbers in Britain and Spain. Now, I really don't want to alarm you with this video, that's not what this is about, but I do want to urge you to stay safe. If you have to use a mask, use the right one. Wash your hands or wear gloves. Don't touch your eyes, mouth, or nose when you're in a public place unless you've washed your hands. And if you feel that you're at higher risk because of being in a more populated city, then try to stay inside as much as possible. As of making this video, according to statistics from China, there are 37,609 reported cases and 815 deaths. Just three days ago, the death toll was about 500. So more than 800 people have died. For comparison, during the 2002-2003 SARS epidemic, which also started in China, 774 people died worldwide. So we've already surpassed that with the coronavirus. Overall, there is a problem with the data that we're receiving from China. This data is based on a confirmation of infection, and the quarantined cities have mostly run out of testing kits required to document these cases. The rest of the world is held to a different standard than China for reporting data on infection. The US, for example, uses algorithmic extrapolation to predict patient counts, which gives us a general idea of where we are and where we're going. China doesn't do this. They report only data on confirmed cases. One thing that lets us know just how incorrect their data might be is that during previous flu seasons in 2016 and 2017, the US, which has just a tiny fraction of China's population, reported between 10,000 and 20,000 deaths for each season. China, just to compare, with five times the population of the US, reported 56 deaths. Not in the thousands or even in the hundreds at all. They're saying that only 56 people died. The following year, they reported 41 which is very clearly statistically impossible. So unfortunately, these numbers coming from China are to be taken with a huge grain of salt. And even if we could trust their data, which it really doesn't look like we can, YouTube, please don't cancel me, a lot of people that are infected simply stay at home like they have the flu, and so they're not accounted for in the medical system. It also looks like hospitals in main cities are overcrowded, so people are avoiding them as a whole, thinking that they might get even sicker if they were to visit one. There's an official declaration by the Chinese government stating that bodies may not be transferred and funerals are not allowed. So they're under order to cremate the bodies that have been infected in order to avoid further spreading the virus. The World Health Organization estimates that between 290,000 and 650,000 people die every year from the common cold, which is also very obviously a virus, but sounds a lot more friendly because it doesn't have the word virus in it. But unlike for the common cold, we haven't been able to develop a vaccine to prevent the coronavirus. By the way, a vaccine works by training your immune system to recognize and fight pathogens, either viruses or bacteria. To do this, certain molecules from the pathogen must be introduced to the body so it can trigger an immune response. These molecules are called antigens, and they're present on all viruses and bacteria. By injecting these molecules into the body, the immune system can safely learn to recognize them as hostile invaders. If the bacteria or virus reappears, the immune system will recognize the antigens immediately and attack aggressively before the pathogen can spread or even cause sickness. So vaccines are a weakened version of the virus that will allow your body to recognize and fight the real virus if you ever come in contact with it, which is why people can sometimes get a bit sick from vaccines. When the coronavirus comes in contact with human cells, it binds to receptors in that cell. The outer layers of the virus, or these hammer-like projections, are basically a key, and these keys are able to open the lock on our cells. Once the coronavirus opens up our cells using its key, it gains access to the cell's machinery, and it uses our cell's mechanisms to make copies of its own genetic material in a process called replication. Which is why everyone wants to go viral on the internet, nobody wants to go bacterial, and that's because viruses can replicate a lot faster than bacteria. If you'd like this video about viruses to go viral so people can learn about this, give me a thumbs up so the YouTube gods can recommend my video to more people. After the coronavirus hijacks the cell's machinery and starts making the different components of itself, your cell's machinery is now making viruses, one after another, which can end up being millions of viruses being made by your cells, 
because now they don't work for you. They work for the virus. Since it's making so many copies of itself, it often reaches all the way up to the cell membrane and then the virus breaks out, bursting and destroying the cell in the process. After it's out, it moves on to neighbor cells to repeat the same process. As your cells start to die, your body goes into high alert and triggers an immune system response, which is what leads to the symptoms we feel when infected. Our immune system is incredible at trying to keep us safe, and it has different systems in place to fight off invaders. One purpose of a fever is to raise the body's temperature enough to kill off certain bacteria and viruses that are sensitive to temperature changes. As we create more mucus and phlegm, it makes it harder for the virus to attach to the cells. So think of you trying to get a grip on something that's really slippery. It's not as easy. Mucus also helps us get rid of our dead cells and some virus cells. If we're infected, then we tend to feel tired and weak, and that's because the body is occupying the energy that would normally be available to you into fighting off the infection. Our bodies also tend to feel sore when we're fighting a virus, and this is because our bones are in the process of creating more white blood cells. These are the kind of cells that fight the good fight for us. Now, our bodies only start to do this after our cells start to die, which means that the virus has already replicated tons of times and is way ahead of us by the time that our body realizes it and starts to fire off our defense mechanisms. Our line of defense includes creating antibodies, which is a bit longer to explain, so just know that an antibody is also known as immunoglobin, and it's a large Y-shaped protein produced mainly by plasma cells, and it's used by the immune system to neutralize pathogens like bacteria and viruses. Like with most viruses, a healthy immune system is very likely to fight off the coronavirus. But people with compromised immune systems, including young children and elderly people, aren't always capable of fighting off the virus entirely through. It looks like this virus has affected in large part the elderly, since as we age, our immune system slows down, and in an attempt to fight off a serious infection, it can kind of go into overdrive, in a way that we end up attacking ourselves. So the virus itself isn't always the cause of death. When our immune system is already weak and it's busy fighting infection, it's distracted by giving so much attention to the current issue. And this is when other pathogens, including bacteria and other viruses, can see their way in, which can lead to organ failure and death. The one thing we can do as individuals is avoid becoming infected, which is a lot easier said than done, for sure. As some of you who follow me on Instagram might already know, I recently left my job and life in New York City so I can move to a mountain house in Norway so that I can live cheaply and humbly and be able to create videos full time. I've actually been here for eight days and this is my first video since living in the mountain and during my time in both airports, I may or may not have freaked out just a little bit because there were seas of people walking around with masks and even sanitary gloves. Once there, I immediately realized I should have brought a mask with me since the airport is definitely a dangerous place to be in during an international viral outbreak. You just come across so many people from so many countries. I was as careful as possible even without the mask. I just tried to hold all doors with a napkin between my hand and the door, made sure to wash my hands frequently, and didn't get close to anyone unless I had to. I was generally observant of my surroundings while trying to avoid anyone who might have been coughing or sneezing. Having lived in such a populated city like New York for over 10 years, this isn't the first time that I experienced anxiety while in a public place. The subway, which you take regularly if you're a New Yorker, is an extremely dirty place that can get you sick even if there isn't a viral outbreak. It's important to always practice good hygiene and prevention by trying to not have direct contact with places that are touched by a lot of people on a daily basis. And if you can't avoid it or don't have anything to protect yourself with, then washing your hands and using hand sanitizer regularly are definitely a must. Overall, even after the coronavirus isn't of high risk, I still recommend maintaining your immune system as healthy as possible so we can successfully fight off other pathogens that will inevitably come across in the future. You can actually help your immune system help you by eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables, exercising regularly. If you drink alcohol, which our body kind of processes as a poison, drink it only in moderation. Try to get adequate sleep, which I don't know what that looks like, and try to minimize stress as much as possible. I know. I also can't relate. I know it's really hard to lead a healthy lifestyle, but it's well worth it when your body's in danger and has to protect you and needs to be strong enough to do so. As part of my move to the mountain I'm currently on, a big inspiration aside from being able to work on making content full time, which I love doing, was that I'll be able to be away from all the toxicity that I was exposed to in the city. I'm not near anything, so whatever I bought on my way from the airport to the cabin is all I have, and I made sure that it was a combination of fruits, veggies, and healthy snacks. Which means no more meat, and no more processed sugars or carbs. 
please let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a video on how to leave your 9 to 5 or just how to leave the toxicity in your life behind even if you're still surrounded by it, which is something I started doing while living in New York and it ultimately led me here. If you'd like to support the channel, know that most of my videos are not monetized, including this one, because I speak about controversial topics that are not suitable for advertisers. And aside from that, a lot of the materials I use in my videos are copyrighted because I don't like sacrificing quality. And so if my videos ever do make anything, it ends up going to the copyright holders. So I've opened up a Patreon account where I've designed different packages that you can pledge to and get awesome perks with every video. You can also vote and decide on which topic you'd like for me to talk about next. It's pretty nerve-wracking for me to not have a formal job for the first time since I was a teenager, and any amount you pledge really helps. Literally, it'll help me buy food, which is expensive to get while living on a mountain. To visit my Patreon, click the link on the screen or go to patreon.com forward slash cognitive culture. Here's an incredibly special thanks to my Patreons, Jenny, Gabriel, Nadia, Edward, Rosie, Elvis, Peter, and everyone else that's contributed for other packages. Cheers. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments what kinds of topics you'd like to see on the channel. Hit the subscribe button so my next video pops up on your screen, and I will see you next time.